emerged as the two states that could decide the race. Donald Trump can still win, but it's a narrowing path. His campaign has launched a flurry of legal challenges, demanding counting stop in some states and a recount in another. With deepening uncertainty over the state of the race and how it could be decided, thousands of voters have taken their fury to the streets. Catherine Diss begins our coverage. Man, democracy. Donald Trump made a false claim of victory. As the vote tally presses on, signs everywhere. Waiting is the hardest part. Unless the people stand up and make it clear that every vote has to count, the election will be stolen. It's an accusation being thrown around on both sides. The Democrats know that the only way that they could win this election is to cheat in Pennsylvania. That's one of the key battleground states yet to be decided. There are more than 20 electoral votes at stake here, and counting is expected to continue for at least another day. This is a stress test of the ideals upon which this country was founded. And I will do everything within my power to ensure that the results are fair, and that every vote is counted. Earlier, Donald Trump claimed he'd won in Pennsylvania, Georgia and North Carolina, which are all still in contention. Twitter hid his follow-up tweet that there may have been a large number of secretly dumped ballots in Michigan and that it's been widely reported, a claim deemed by the social media giant as disputed and potentially misleading. It's clear that we're winning enough states to reach 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. Here in his home state of Delaware, Joe Biden has declared the people have spoken, saying he's received more votes than any other candidate in history. But there will be hurdles in his path to the White House. A small group of protesters called for vote counting to be stopped at this ballot processing centre in Michigan. One of the states where the Trump administration has filed lawsuits questioning the validity of the ballots cast. With both Michigan and Wisconsin in the Democrats' column, the momentum is firmly in Joe Biden's favour. Now all eyes are on Georgia, where the margin is narrowing. We're going to finish tonight. As long as it takes, we're going to be here. That's why we're bringing in fresh bodies. And Trump supporters are on the full offensive. Do you think we're stupid? Do you think we're fools? You know something? The Democrats do think you're stupid, and they do think you're fools. The Biden crime family steal the election! It's feared accusations Donald Trump has made against the validity of the vote could incite violence. The Biden crime family steal this election! Waiting may be the hardest part, but in this country bitterly divided, it's also fraught with danger. Catherine Dis, ABC News, Wilmington, Delaware. Well, let's look at where the race is right now. Some key states have stopped counting for the night, but others are still reporting. With the latest on the state of play, here's election analyst Anthony Green. After two days of counting, we're still in the position we're not exactly certain who is the President of the United States, but Joe Biden is much closer. At the moment, we've got him on 264 Electoral College votes. That includes Arizona. Some American networks still haven't given Arizona away. If you give him Nevada as well, he reaches 270 and is President. But let's look at some of those other states, what's going on elsewhere where the result is close. Georgia, for example, we've had further counting today and at the end of counting, Georgia has only a 23,000 vote gap and there's about 5% of the vote to come and that is still a very close contest. The other state everyone is still watching is Pennsylvania. That was thought to be one of the key states at this election. It still looks like a big gap there, but everything that's to be counted is pre-polls and postals where the Democrats are doing extremely strongly and quite a number of American networks are predicting that Joe Biden, despite being behind now, will end up winning the state. Regardless of the result, the division and discord in the lead up to this vote has stirred more Americans than ever before to have their say. Correspondent Greg Janet explains where some of the battles were won and lost. It's time for Donald Trump to pack his bags and go home. This is a choice between a Trump super boom or a Biden depression. That's what it is. The whole point in a two-horse race was to split Americans into fours and against. We are going to win four more years in the White House. No surprise, it worked. 
The divisions don't evaporate the day after election day, but behind the record turnout lie some hints about how and why 70 million people lent Joe Biden's way and roughly 67 million to Donald Trump. He's set us on a track that couldn't be better with the economy. It's trying to make change. The only way we can do that is get out here and vote. Exit surveys again prove the black-white divide broke in the Democrats' favour. Look, the truth is Donald Trump has done more to harm black America than any president in modern history. And the economic hope versus pandemic fear pitch can almost be traced too. Wisconsin and Michigan both ran high daily positive cases in the final weeks and swung blue. Republicans across the Sunbelt states where peak rates were hit back in the summer seem to have voted for normality. Then there's age and opportunity. Phoenix, Arizona, with its affordable housing, is America's fastest growing region. It's also never been more Democrat-leaning, washing a once Republican stronghold and the base of the late Senator John McCain with a deep blue rinse. But this guy is a stone-cold phony. Good old campaign cut-through can't be discarded. Although the polls were out, some Americans did look past a few of Donald Trump's foibles, and he increased his voting places with a barnstorming finish. As far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. He now draws on that for his charge to the courts. What Americans were saying about their government and their lot at this pandemic poll will be the stuff of political analysis and books for years. Trying to answer the question, was this a once in a century anomaly or the new normal for a country split right down the middle? And there will be no blue states and red states when we win. Just the United States of America. In either case, the split is clear and present right now and it could fall to an occupant of the White House or those in the courts to deal with its consequences. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Washington. And later this hour, we'll be speaking to US Bureau Chief David Lipson from Washington, D.C. on what we can expect in the coming days and weeks. The Prime Minister has refused to be drawn on Donald Trump's baseless claim of electoral fraud, despite a former Australian ambassador to the US appearing to support the conspiracy theory. Scott Morrison says he has great confidence in the democracy and institutions of the United States. Political editor Andrew Proben explains. Scott Morrison's seen the Donald Trump show up close. He believes a lot of the same things I believe. I guess. That helps. And after this Ohio factory visit came dangerously close to being a Republican rally, the Prime Minister knows he has to be a lot more careful. I'm not a participant in the US political process. Um, I am a partner. The US President's outrageous, untruthful claim that he'd been denied an election victory by fraud, fraud is the nightmare scenario America's allies feared. Democracy is too important for uh, it to be undermined uh, by, by any individual. We respect the decisions that the American people make in their democracy. The Prime Minister showing more faith in the US electoral system than the president. The thing about great institutions and democracies is, is they deal with whatever challenges come, just like our own does. He hates losing. He doesn't accept that he loses, and he usually reverts to litigation. Australia's former ambassador to the US, Joe Hockey, an occasional Trump golf buddy, fueled the conspiracy theory when asked if there'd been fraud. Oh, for sure. I mean, it will be. But the question is whether it's enough to change the election outcome. It doesn't help to have Australians make comments that aren't thought through. We should wait for that outcome, and I don't think Australia should be providing a running commentary. If Joe Biden ultimately triumphs, he won't be sworn in for another 77 days. So there's little to be gained by Australia calling out Donald Trump. And while the Democrat candidate would reinstate a more traditional presidential style, one that's more familiar to America's allies, he'll adopt some of his predecessors' trade protectionism. However, Biden will also bring a more aggressive stance on climate change, one that could pressure the Morrison government to be more ambitious. Andrew Proben, ABC News, Canberra. To finance, the US share market has had the biggest post-election rise in history. Here's Alan Kohler. The main American share index, the S&P 500, jumped more than 2% last night and the Nasdaq, which consists mainly of technology companies, 
surged nearly 4%. It was the biggest increase on the day after the presidential election in history, at least since 1932, which is when this chart goes back to. And the reason for it is not actually the presidential election itself, but the one for the Senate, and specifically the fact that the Republican Party looks like retaining control of it. The markets had believed the polls and were betting on a blue wave. But a Republican Senate means President Biden's health care plan won't happen. So the biggest gains last night were by health care stocks, while the biggest falls were construction, steel and heavy truck companies, because Joe Biden's infrastructure spending probably won't happen either. Technology stocks went up a lot because they tend to be related to long-term interest rates, which affect their valuations. And last night, the interest rate on American 10-year bonds had the biggest one-day fall in eight months, which was also because of the Republicans keeping control of the Senate, because that means Democrats' big fiscal stimulus spending won't get passed. So the increase in inflation next year that markets were betting on is now less likely. As a result, the US dollar fell and the Australian dollar therefore went up to 71.7 US cents, although the Aussie has been jumping around, not going anywhere for three months. The local share market went up by more than 1%, led by NAB, which reported a smaller than expected decline in profit, and travel stocks because the state borders are opening up at last. And that's finance. To other news now, a 65-year-old Melbourne man has become the first person in Australia to be charged under foreign interference laws. Sonny Young has been charged with preparing to undertake foreign interference and could face up to a decade in jail if found guilty. Earlier this year, he appeared at an event with Immigration Minister Alan Tudge, handing over a donation to Royal Melbourne Hospital. The federal government has not named the country responsible, but Mr Young belongs to groups which have been linked to the Chinese Communist Party. For the sixth consecutive day, there have been no new coronavirus infections in Victoria and there are just 20 active cases. But during the height of the outbreak, it's believed dozens of Victorians contracted the virus while being treated for other ailments in hospital. Patients and doctors are calling on the government to release data about hospital-acquired infections as they have with aged care settings. But as Jessica Longbottom reports, so far, the government has refused. Christina Haywood went into a Frankston Rehabilitation Centre for physio on a new hip and came out with coronavirus. I'm very angry because it has wrecked our lives for four months and it didn't need to happen. The 74-year-old contracted the virus in July along with 16 other Peninsula Health patients. Her hip has recovered, but the long-term symptoms of COVID linger, landing her back in hospital just two weeks ago. You can't pinpoint one thing. It just, you just feel so bad, your whole body. Karen Spokes' mother, Gloria Thatcher, was admitted to Brunswick Private Hospital in June for high blood pressure. She contracted COVID shortly before she was released and died two weeks later. Karen says she's still waiting for the health department or the hospital to tell her how it happened. I think um, the health system has really failed us. By piecing together publicly released information, it's clear at least 25 patients have contracted COVID while in hospital and four have died. The Department of Health and Human Services has denied repeated requests for the actual figure, but says a report on the issue will be released in the coming weeks. What is known is that almost 2,000 workers in hospitals and other medical settings have contracted coronavirus. It's hard to say, but if we're talking about, you know, a couple of thousand health workers, could be hundreds of patients. It's really important that we understand how those infections occurred with patients in hospital so that we can be prepared and that in the future patients aren't infected like they have been. In a statement, DHHS says its priority is minimising the spread of coronavirus and making sure Victorians continue to have access to quality care. Christina Haywood and the family of Gloria Thatcher just hope the system's improved in case there's a next time. Jessica Longbottom, ABC News, Melbourne. One of Sydney's biggest events will be back on the...